example. And then I'll go on to how to recognize symptoms with these issues. And of course, this get then leads on to lots of other negative health effects of the thyroid, um, which can have a knock-on effect in other systems in the body, so metabolism, skin health, digestion, which often people forget about as well. And then I'm going to go on to some of the tests you can have, um, different types of tests. And then, of course, I'll talk about lots of the nutritional aspects um, to support thyroid health and some of the lifestyle choices as well. Um, feel free to ask the odd question if it's very relevant to the slide as I go through, uh, but otherwise I'll leave a little bit of time at the end as well so we can have questions then. So a very brief introduction to the thyroid gland. Um, it's positioned in the neck, so surrounding the trachea. It's just below the thyroid cartilage, so where you can feel the Adam's apple. It has two lobes which are connected, so it's often described as a butterfly-shaped organ. Um, and it's an endocrine gland, so basically this means that it secretes hormones directly into the blood. So with the secretion of these hormones, this is going to significantly impact energy metabolism, protein synthesis, and that, of course, affects growth and lots of other functions in the body as a knock-on effect. So in terms of the different hormones that are released from the thyroid glands, there's three main hormones, T4, T3, and calcitonin. So all the functions of the thyroid depend on production of these hormones. So you have T4, which is often referred to as thyroxine, um, T3, and then the calcitonin for blood calcium. So T4 and T3 are the hormones important for growth and development, the metabolism, every single cell in the body, regulation of body temperature, uh, also heart rate as well. Then we have calcitonin production, and this has a very different role to T4 and T3 in that it regulates calcium homeostasis and phosphate in the body. So when calcium is released from the thyroid, this helps to take the calcium levels from the blood, reducing these levels um, and putting this into the bone. So it's very important for bone growth, especially um, when very young and, and growing. So then the really main... Um, Things to remember are the functions of thyroid and these three hormones that it's producing for lots of different functions in the body. It's all to do with metabolism and bone health. So in terms of the different types of cells and the surface of the thyroid gland, it's covered in lots of follicles. These are constantly absorbing iodine and the two different types of cells, follicular cells and parafollicular cells, secrete either the T4, T3 or calcitonin. So it's the follicular cells secreting these important T4 and T3 for metabolism and the parafollicular cells for the calcitonin to help with the homeostasis of calcium. Um, so around these follicular cells, it's just a single layer of epithelial cells surrounding them. So I've gone through just briefly about the thyroid gland, but there's also the parathyroid glands. Um, so if you ever get asked about this, it's quite good to be aware of their functions a little bit as well. Uh, so they're very different to the thyroid glands, but they're on the back. So you can see four very small um, parts here, which are just on the back. So four very small glands on the back of the thyroid gland. Uh, these release PTH, so parathyroid hormone. And this also helps to control calcium phosphate homeostasis, so similar to the calcitonin produced in the thyroid. Um, however, it has the opposite effect. So this helps to break down the bone and release calcium into the blood. So this helps to regulate um, calcium levels in the blood. And this also helps to increase absorption of calcium from the body. So it's a very, very, a very important glands in terms of calcium homeostasis, especially. Um, also, if someone's, for example, has had their thyroid gland removed and you're worried about calcium levels in the blood, it's often more important that they have their parathyroid hormones for this. So normally, those are quite healthy in the blood if someone still has the parathyroid glands, if they've managed to, to keep those intact. So, of course, for the thyroid to work, it has to be stimulated. And this is the process in which this happens. So we have the hypothalamus. Um, and this produces a hormone called TRH, which then stimulates the pituitary gland. 
This then produces TSH. This is a thyroid stimulating hormone. And this is one you hear about all the time, whether someone has high or low TSH. Um, and this is produced from the pituitary gland to stimulate the, the thyroid gland. And of course, that's going to allow the thyroid to produce the T4, T3 and calcitonin. So, of course, we need every single step and it's good to be aware that it's not just um, stimulated on its own. It, it does require the other, um, the other glands and other hormones produced as well. So, of course, the thyroid gland can't just be constantly stimulated. It needs to have a negative feedback loop. So the body is quite clever in regulating levels as long as the thyroid is healthy. So, for example, if T4 levels are quite high, so if there's lots of reproduction of T4, um, the body then sends back a, a message to the pituitary gland to reduce TSH. So the thyroid stimulating hormone is then reduced and then thyroid function can reduce back down to normal. Something. The opposite of this would be, say, exposure to cold. So when the body is exposed to cold, this then increases production by the hypothalamus, um, increasing then the TSH production, and then that stimulates the thyroid, which increases thermogenesis. You get more heat production as a result. So it's quite clever in the way it does actually regulate things as long as the thyroid is healthy. Um, and then there's steroids, there's sex hormones, um, and high iodine, very high iodine can actually have the opposite effect again by reducing TSH that reduces thyroid function. So, for example, if someone has very high estrogen levels, very um, high testosterone, that can reduce thyroid function slightly. So you need to um, be aware in terms of balancing thyroid function with, with some of these. Um, but generally, the body is quite good at, at regulating this. Um, so the T4 to T3 conversion in the body, the thyroid, of course, produces both. It's going to produce T4 and T3. Um, but T4 is produced in much, much higher degree. So about four times the amount compared to T3 is produced in the, in the thyroid gland. Um, however, T3 is more biologically active. So T3 is much more effective in terms of regulating metabolism, body temperature. So the body converts T4 to T3. Um, if it can do, as long as you have a um, healthy functioning body that's going to be able to make this conversion. And that's quite important to note that not everybody is able to convert T4 to T3 particularly well. And this conversion happens uh, slightly in the thyroid gland, but mostly in other organs um, such as liver, kidney and the spleen as well. So if someone is unable to convert, it is possible to have quite healthy high levels of T4 However, they may have very, very low levels of T3, for example, and this may result in high TSH. However, it may not if their T4 is quite high. Um, so definitely want to note that clients can have very, very different levels. T4, T3 and TSH is not just as simple as measuring T4 and T3. And then there's free T4 and T3 you may have heard about, which is basically um, the hormones which have been cleaved from their protein carriers, so they readily used in tissues. So for the actual synthesis of these hormones, for T3 and T4 to be synthesized by the thyroid gland, um, the most important things you need to diet are tyrosine and iodine. So these are required to actually make the thyroglobulin, which is stored in the in the thyroid gland, and that helps to produce the T4 and T3. So Whenever considering any clients with um, thyroid issues or just generally if you want to support their thyroid health, these are the two most important things to concentrate on to make sure they've actually got the building blocks to make the hormones. That's really the basic first step. So tyrosine being an amino acid is in lots of very high protein foods such as eggs, cheese and turkey, for example. Um, tyrosine can also be synthesized from the amino acid phenylalanine as well. So some similar food sources, chicken, fish, cheese, beans, for example. Um, so if anyone is low on these foods, if someone has a very low protein diet, for example, if they're vegan and they're not getting any of these foods in, they may likely have quite light, low tyrosine um, levels. However, most people, if they're getting quite a high protein diet, will be getting them in as as long as um, they're digesting their food properly as well. Of course, always important to, to look at their digestion as well. So I don't usually recommend tyrosine supplements. I usually recommend a, 
a higher protein diet for someone if they have thyroid issues. However, if someone is vegan, for example, and they don't want to take any um, protein powders, you can take a supplement that exists and it will really help to, to increase synthesis of the T4 and T3. However, it's not always necessary, but it's good to be aware that these exist if someone's read about something to do with tyrosine and they come to see you and, and have a few questions. Um, often people take it for anti-stress as well, so it's great for getting dopamine levels up in the brain. Um, but if, if you are going to supplement, I would recommend around 500 to 1,000 milligrams uh, just before food, so around 30 minutes to an hour is a good time to have. Um, some people, if they have bipolar type symptoms, it can exacerbate it a little bit. Um, so not particularly good for those kind of people. And it can increase blood pressure slightly if someone already has very high blood pressure. So they're the only really um, couple of, of areas where you may not wish to, to supplement. Um, of course, try not to add too many supplements in alongside prescription thyroid medication. If someone's on a, a strong um, prescription and you're supplementing more tyrosine, it could increase levels too much. If some, say if someone had a hypothyroidism, it could go the other way and go hyper. So always be wary of thyroid medication as well. Um, and another slight negative is that can cause digestive discomfort in people who are taking quite high doses and even migraines. So there seems to be a lot of negative about the supplements, but I just thought it's important for you to be aware. Um, sorry, someone's just saying the sound has cut out a couple of times. Is anyone else having any problems or is it all OK? Yeah. Okay. Okay, everyone else seems to be fine, so I'll carry on. So in terms of tyrosine supplements, yeah, so maybe for the very few people, if you've done lots of tests and you find out that their production of T4 or T3 is really low, it could be a last resort, but I wouldn't usually recommend that as one of the first things, but it's good to be aware. So the next important um, ingredient for making the T4, T3 is, of course, iodine. And this is an ingredient that's talked about so much in terms of thyroid health. So, of course, it's a trace element. Um, it's in lots of foods um, to do with the sea, basically. Seaweed, fish, um, seafood, and also a little bit in eggs as well. So, again, if someone's vegetarian or vegan, their levels may be slightly lower um, there's also some foods which are fortified now with iodine. They never used to be deficiencies; used to be much, much more common. Um, but they still, they st people are often still quite low in iodine, but severe deficiencies are, are less common. Um, and the thyroglobulin I was talking about a little bit earlier uh, that uh, that stores all the iodine. This helps to produce the T4 and T3. is is very important that you get enough in there for the production of thyroglobulin. So what can go wrong? In terms of dysfunction of the thyroid, um, there's only really a few things that can go wrong. There's hypothyroidism. So this is the underactive thyroid. It's not quite working as well as you'd want it to. There's a hyperthyroidism. So it's working in overdrive. There's thyroiditis. So this is just an inflammation of the thyroid gland, which is associated with lots of other conditions. Um, and then there's thyroid cancer, nodules, any kind of growth on the thyroid gland as well. I'll go through these individually. So first of all is hypothyroidism. And this is probably one of the most common ones um, that you'll have in, with clients in terms of asking lots of questions. If someone is finding it very difficult to lose weight, for example, they may, may believe that their thyroid isn't quite working as well as it should, as that would result in reduced um, metabolism. Um, many people will go to their GP and have their thyroid measures and they'll find out they're norm, in the normal range. Um, they may then come to you and and ask exactly what they can do in terms of weight loss. And that's just a, a common reason why someone may come to you as weight loss and they might ask about thyroid. And there's often a subclinical thyroid, hypothyroidism that can be helped very easily. So it's low production of T3 and T4. It could, of course, be a fairly good T4 production and low conversion to T3. Um, generally, production of TSH from the pituitary gland is quite high. So the body is recognizing that T3 and T4 are quite low. So it's producing more of this thyroid stimulating hormone to try and get levels up a little bit. So the causes of hypothyroidism 
it could be an abnormality from birth. So if someone's had these issues quite severely from a very young age, you could consider that. There's lots of autoimmune conditions such as Hashimoto's. Um, these will often be diagnosed quite early on by GPs. Um, so you often may know this when they when they come to see you. Um, a very common one is iodine deficiency in terms of a, a cause for hypothyroidism. And then, of course, you've got the very obvious surgical removal of the thyroid gland. So if someone's had cancer uh, and they've had either a part or the full thyroid gland removed, then that's going to reduce production of T3 and T4. So that can cause the, the thyroid to, to be underactive. So some of the symptoms to look out for. So I was just looking at a question. Can hypo clients also have problems with gaining weight? Um, it would be very, very unlikely. It's possible if they had, say, an eating disorder or if they had habits of not eating much, they were very stressed. Of course, if they're not eating much, they, they wouldn't put on as much weight, but it's, it's quite unusual. But yes, it is possible. So back to some of the symptoms. Um, so generally weight gain, of course, yes, it could, they could be a healthy weight still, but it's more about them not being able to lose weight when they try, for example. So if someone's doing lots of exercise and they feel they're eating a lot less than other people around them and they're still quite heavy, um, that's some, some of the kind of key contributing factors to this. Also, people feeling the cold as well. So if someone often feels very cold, very low tolerance to the cold, um, this is another another symptom that's very common. Uh, everything's basically working slowly. The body's not producing much heat. Thermogenesis is quite low, so that's why you have the, the feeling of cold. Uh, other symptoms such as brittle hair, brittle nails, and dry skin as well. So these are all symptoms of hypothyroidism. Again, it's just a sign of everything really working very slowly in the body. And then there's a swelling around the neck. So it's called a goiter. And this is just a slight swelling of the thyroid trying to, to function, um, but not quite getting there. And of course, there's going to be reduced metabolism. So that's explaining the weight gain in, in most individuals. Also, digestion is impacted quite a lot. So everyone always concentrates on weight and people putting on weight. But it's always key to note all their other symptoms. So, for example, if they're constantly constipated, if they're having quite a lot of fiber in their diet, they're still quite constipated. Um, they could have a very, very low um, slow transit time. And then you have fertility as well. So fertility is always impacted um, with thyroid issues, whether it's hypo or hyper, it's always going to reduce fertility as well. So we have, when you also get goiter and hyperthyroidism, I have a question. Yes, you do. You can have swelling in both. So whether it's hypo or hyper, you can still have the swelling in both. So that's the goiter. So hyperthyroidism, the overactive thyroid, this is an overproduction of the T3 and T4. And the most common causes of this are linked with diseases, lots of autoimmune immune diseases. Um, so you have Graves disease, for example. The antibodies are basically attacking the thyroid gland. Um, and this is when you have the, the bulging eyes, um, which is a, a, a common symptom of Graves disease in particular. Um, so if someone has the very bulging eyes, this is um, a very clear indication of this issue. And also over the shins of the legs as well. So with Graves disease, it almost looks like psoriasis. It's just a, a thick um, production of skin. So it's too much skin production in a certain area. Um, and it's, a lot of these are genetic. Um, so it's genetic predisposition. Um, there's also plumber's disease. So this increases lumps. Um, so it's benign lumps that grow. And as a result, these this tissue, this excess tissue actually produces more T4. So that then, um, if converted to T3, would increase metabolism, would increase all these um, issues. And then we have inflammation of the thyroid. So someone else is, is losing me as well. If you do have any issues, if you can't hear me, if you do log out and then log back in again, again it does normally work. So if there's anyone that's having issues, please do that. I think most of you are okay. You don't seem to be complaining, so I'll, I'll carry on. Okay, it's all right. Brilliant. So inflammation of the thyroid is, of course, going to be a key part in all these kind of autoimmune conditions. Um, a lot of the conditions with hyperthyroidism, 
have inflammation involved. So again, I was saying with the, the goiter, it can be enlarged with an underactive or an overactive. And the reason a thyroid grows is really due to the lack of the negative feedback. Um, so I was saying earlier how the body is quite good at regulating by reducing the TSH production. Um, however, if there's no negative feedback loop there, it can just keep on growing, basically. So some of the symptoms, the key symptoms to look out for for hyperthyroidism. Of course, you have the swollen neck. So this may be quite subtle if if the hypothyroidism isn't too severe, it may be quite large. Um, if they have a very swollen neck, clients are most likely um, will have visited their GP. But if they haven't, then of course you can recommend this to them as well. So heart rate is often increased quite a lot with hypothyroidism. It'll be over 80, perhaps 90 um, at rest. Um, increased cell sensitivity to adrenaline. So this can make people quite stressed, feel quite stressed, quite anxious. So someone with hyperthyroidism often feels anxiety quite easily. You have the protruding eyes, um, weight loss is common, not for everybody, but it's very difficult for people to gain weight if they have an overactive thyroid. Um, in terms of heat, so the opposite to intolerant of cold is intolerant of heat so for someone who feels hot all the time and, and if they can't feel that they, they can cool themselves down um, basically their body is producing too much heat constantly so they find it very difficult to be in very hot areas and the skin growth I was talking about earlier as well it's just excess skin that can grow on the legs as well and that's that's more in severe cases yeah that. so generally increased metabolism um, occurs you have faster digestion so it's much more common to, for people to have diarrhea for example or loose stools um, and reduced fertility again so thyroiditis basically is the inflammation of the thyroid gland um, a lot of autoimmune conditions it can also be fluctuation between an overactive and underactive thyroid so for example if someone's on lots of medication they come off the medication um they have severe serious dietary changes um stress because this can often um cause fluctuation and of course that's linked to mood swings as well and um, fluctuations of other hormones but it's generally going to increase inflammation in the thyroid and then there's lots of other conditions, Hashimoto's, um, Zocurvain, and of course, after pregnancy as well, the thyroid is often enlarged during pregnancy. So this can cause a little bit of inflammation there. So for anyone with these conditions, they're most likely to have been diagnosed by their, G their GP. Um, but if not, or if they're recovering, it's always important to make sure that we're keeping the inflammation at a healthy level. And then we have thyroid cancer and nodules, any kind of growths around the thyroid. There's often no symptoms, um, even with cancer. Someone may feel slight lump in the neck. So although the thyroid gland is, is quite small, it's quite difficult to actually feel. Um, they, someone may feel slight, slight lumps in the neck. And if that's the case, and if anyone mentions anything um, to do with lumps in the neck, then of course, um, refer to their GP. And they, they may be completely painless as well. So it's good to really know that, that there may be no pain at all, um, important note. So in terms of the medical treatment options out there, it's always good to be aware of what your clients may have been through or they may be going through um, next as well. So of course, there's gonna be a very basic physical examination over the neck. You can't necessarily feel the thyroid gland very well unless it has abnormal growth or unless it's, it's swollen. So a GP will often feel to check for, for lumps and, um, and swelling as well. So if anything comes up with just a feel, if they can feel anything, they may then run blood tests as well. So testing for the thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin, of course, the levels are going to increase if the thyroid has grown, for example. Um, so that really helps to identify growths, um, abnormalities, for example, or, or um, any kind of um, swelling as well would link to higher production. 
So the next would be a neck ultrasound. So this is a really good way of sensitively measuring any kind of abnormalities. Um, and after this, then down the line, if, if they wanted to find out exactly what was going on, if something came up, clients would probably be referred for a CT scan, MRI or a PET scan. So that's what's available. Um, and of course, with blood tests as well, they may also measure T4, perhaps T3 as well. But these are really for treatment options if they're looking for cancers growth. So in terms of the diagnostic tests that are out there that you can actually use as a practitioner, first of all, there's the measuring temperature. So for clients, you can recommend they do this themselves. So first thing in the morning is often best as the temperature is generally the same. Um, if their temperature is quite low on a consistent basis, say, for example, it's below 36 degrees or even below 36.3, around that kind of mark, um, that's quite a low temp body temperature to have. And this is the outside body temperature, for example, if you had it under your arm with, with a thermometer. Um, you ideally want it to be 36.5. If it's quite high consistently, this would suggest more of an overactive thyroid. So it's, a, it's quite a rough indication, but it's a good way um, to get clients interested in perhaps then testing, doing a, a urine or a blood sample, for example, if they're if they're unsure, but if something is indicating they may have thyroid issues, it's a, it's a good starting point. Um, then there's lots of different tests you can have. There's so many out there. So, for example, the serum levels you can measure of TSH, and so the thyroid stimulating hormone, T4, T3, and then there's the free T4 and the free T3 as well. So someone's just asked a question. I'm a massage therapist. Can I feel differences in neck lump between tighten muscles and cancer? Um, I think you'd have to really go through proper training to be able to understand exactly where the thyroid is and, and, and what the lumps would actually feel like. Um, so I think I would always refer someone to the GP if you have any doubts at all, if there's any kind of unusual um growths or lumps in the neck without doubt just refer them on or mention something to them so they're at least aware but yes of course there's lots of things that could be um quite similar so back to the tests so we have um the free t4 and t free t3 as well that can be measured um and of course the conversion to t4 to t3 is one of the most important things really um, to check. So if you're measuring just T4, for example, it doesn't really give you a wide picture of what's actually going on. It really just gives the, the basics. So some very basic NHS tests may just measure T4. Um, I think most of them measure T3 now as well. But it's important to really look at both of them and compare so that you can actually figure out the conversion levels. Um, so, for example, if someone has a selenium deficiency, if they're very stressed, um, this can impact their conversion. There's lots of selenium required in this conversion process. Um, there's another um, test you can do for reverse T3. So this is a metabolite of T4. So T4 is usually converted to T3 in the body. However, sometimes it can be converted to reverse T3, which is very similar. However, it is quite inactive. And not many people will recommend this test. It is quite unusual, quite different. Um, if you've tested everything else and you really can't figure out what's going on, then it may be worth worth this eventually um, but it's something to note that it can be quite useful just in case someone is converting a lot of their t4 to the inactive form of t3 rather than the active form which may be why their levels on paper appear quite good but then they they have their symptoms as well someone's just asking how long should an axilla temperature be taken um well of course with women your temperature is going to fluctuate throughout the month so um, even just a few different points throughout the month would be good. Um, but just just in the first thing in the morning, just once in the day is fine. Hope that answers your question. Um, so another test is to measure thyroglobulin, um, so the antibodies um, to these, and this really helps to identify if there's any autoimmune conditions that are causing damage to thyroid tissue as well. So this can help identify Graves' disease, Hashimoto's. So if someone hasn't gone along the GP route and they really want to find out what's going on, it's quite useful to test these as well. And there are a few, a few tests which 
um, combine the TSH, T4, T3 and um, the antibodies as well. So if you really, I'm not sure. Someone's asking, wrong timing, but do we get access to the slides after the webinar? Yes, of course, I'll send all these out. So other tests are urine tests. So we have the, the blood tests that you can do and also the urine. So this is a little bit more accurate. Um, so you measure urine levels over a 24 hour period and it measures the free T3 and free T4 um, that's actually available for the cells to use. And in terms of other, other, other tests, you can test for iodine as well. So of course, as iodine is so important for producing T4 and T3, if someone has levels, um, that could come up in a test as well. So someone's asking another question. Um, I've had tests from Genova which state blood tests are notoriously unreliable and the temperature test is advisable. What, in your experience, is the most reliable? I would always go for the urine test, personally. I would always start off measuring the temperature, um, and then I would go for urine. And I'd always measure TSH as well, just to make sure that you can understand um, if their body is actually producing enough or too, too little. In terms of taking the temperature, so someone's asked if the, the actual time, is it five minutes or longer? Usually with digital temperatures, um, it will take about a minute or so, and it will usually beep when the, the temperature is stable. So in terms, I've already kind of mentioned this, the, the serum versus urine, urine testing. Blood tests are the most commonly used by GPs, and this is really because they're cheaper, they're very easy to carry out, um, and they do give a fairly basic but useful information for most people. So if a blood test is done, is done and someone comes up with very, very high T4, or very, very low T4, um, it often indicates there is some kind of serious issue going on. Uh, however, it doesn't really identify s slight hypothyroidism, for example, if someone has subclinical um, symptoms, this is more useful um, to have a urine test really, it's much more sensitive. Um, but yeah, for subclinical hypothyroidism, I would always recommend urine where possible. And also in terms of the ranges as well, there's always the reference ranges, the GP normal ranges are not necessarily optimal. So this is normal, meaning that they are unlikely to have an autoimmune condition or cancer, for example. However, this is not gonna pick up people who are having issues with anxiety with a hyperthyroidism or weight gain with hypothyroidism. So even if someone has been told their thyroid levels are quite healthy or they're in the normal range, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the healthiest they could be. So this is where we come in as nutritional therapists is really to, to help people get into the absolute optimal, healthiest range possible. So yes, yeah, not normal for everybody, these wide ranges. So back to iodine, as it's one of the most important building blocks to actually produce these hormones, T4 and T3. Um, it's really, really essential that people are getting enough in. So this is the fundamentally most important thing to make sure that your clients have enough iodine in their diet. Um, so it's sourced from sea vegetables, fish, seafood as well. And problems can occur with too little or too much. So if someone has too little, their production of hormone um, hormones is gonna be quite low. Um, too much can also cause issues as well. Um, but most likely someone's going to have too little. So symptoms of deficiency of iodine. Of course, the thyroid is going to uh, be swollen if there's a hypothyroidism, if there's low production of T4 and T3. Also stunted growth as well. So this um, used to be extremely common, um, less so now. But stunted growth um, is significantly um, affected by iodine intake. And developmental delays as well, so it can actually affect the IQ um, of a, of someone who, so when growing up, if someone has a iodine deficiency, it can significantly affect the IQ as well. And there's also some vegetables that can block the absorption of iodine. So even if someone's having quite a good intake of iodine, you've got to consider all other foods as well that may reduce absorption. Um, so these are called goitrogens. This is basically a name um, which reduces absorption. 
iodine. So some of the micronutrients to really concentrate on when supporting the thyroid gland. So whether it's hypo or hyper, you really want to make sure that it has the micronutrients to support their function. So of course, selenium is going to help with the conversion of T4 to T3, so a key um, nutrient there. It also helps to reduce inflammation in the body. So that's great for any of the, the inflammatory conditions. Um, zinc as well is associated so a deficiency of zinc is associated with hypothyroidism so making sure someone has adequate levels of zinc of course um with meats um nuts seeds for example and then there's iron um of course consider malabsorption so if someone has enough iron in their diet whether it's combining these foods with vitamin c to enhance absorption um for example this is always important to note. So I'm just looking at another question. So someone's diagnosed with hypothyroidism and was given a prescription. I tried to eat lots of iodine-rich foods. It's actually actually gave my body rather imbalance of hormone production. I had to increase the amount of medicine. Um, I'm not sure I'd have to understand your case in depth, really. It's quite hard to know why you would have to um, have more of the hormone medicine is usually it'd be completely the opposite usually um if you have more iodine in the diet you'd be able to reduce medication so i'm not sure why you had to increase sorry um so other micronutrients so have iron um, and this is required for the actual production of t4 and t3 and then we have copper which is very important for the hypothalamus so that's going to have a knock-on effect on the stimulation of the thyroid gland. And copper, of course, ideally should be balanced with zinc. So you don't want to have um, an imbalance there. So back to inflammation. As there's so many conditions linked to inflammation um, and the thyroid gland, it's always important to keep inflammation at a healthy level. And this is for any any kind of condition you want to keep inflammation at a healthy level you don't want too much it's going to cause more stress on the body um so omega-3 epa for example actually has actually shown a studies to increase t4 production um and it improves sensitivity to thyroid hormones as well so it's not just reducing inflammation it has other beneficial effects on the thyroid gland as well and in terms of the anti-inflammatory effects epa on its own is going to be very effective. Um, I'd always encourage fish consumption. Of course, it's going to be high in tyrosine and iodine as well. So I think fish is really one of the key foods to recommend in terms of thyroid health, if anything. Um, and in terms of just recommending a general anti-inflammatory diet is, is going to be beneficial. So getting more of the omega-3 fatty acids in and less of the omega-6. Our modern diets are, of course, very, very high in omega-6. There's lots of grass-fed meats. Um, and vegetable oils for example so it's always good to to help to balance this out as well to give the thyroid a little bit of a break and to keep the inflammation down so these are the supplements i would recommend for anyone with an inflammatory condition for example um so if you know they have an inflammatory related condition linked to the thyroid gland i would always definitely recommend a high dose omega-3 epa supplement so we have um these are here, FAMIPA step one and step two. And these are omega-3 EPA concentrates. So I'm sure most of you, you that are watching have probably um, seen some of our other, our other webinars. And we, we speak about EPA, DHA quite a lot. Um, but EPA on its own is much more effective for reducing inflammation without the DHA. So it's a very functional fan. It's going to reduce the inflammation. Um, of course, DHA has its role. And for well-being, it's brilliant. It's it has an important role for brain structure but if you're just concentrating on bringing down the inflammation if it's really therapeutic anti-inflammatory i would go for a high strength epa as much as possible and um, so someone's asking that someone um recommends not to take iodine if there's autoimmunity problems iodine can cause issues if you have too much for example so i would always say from the diet where possible um, you don't want to be putting very, very high doses in supplement form. However, if someone's having quite healthy levels in the diet, it's usually absolutely fine. 
So back to omega-3 EPA. So yeah, so if we're regulating inflammation for anyone, we'd go in with the, the EPA. Um, and these supplements are derived from wild anchovies. This is a completely sustainable source as well. And the concentration is so high, the capsules are very small, so it's very, very easy for people to take as well. So for the step one, there's a 90% concentration of EPA. So compared to just a standard fish oil being around 18%, it's much, much higher. So you're getting a, a very high dose in small capsules. So 1,000 milligrams is the dose from two small capsules. And there's a little bit of vitamin E in there added as well. So this helps with the stability of the oil. And Farmipa step two, so this is Farmipa maintain. This is a slightly lower dose. This is 80% EPA. And this provides 640 milligrams of EPA. And then you have 18 milligrams of the GLA as well. So that's from evening primrose oil, a little bit of the omega-6. And the reason we have step one, step two, or restore and maintain, is because if someone has a lot of inflammation, you don't really want to be putting in any omega-6 initially, getting very high levels of omega-3 EPA is much more beneficial initially for the first say three to six months for example and then step two is really the maintenance so it's for healthy long-term um well-being keeping the inflammation level low once you've brought it down so if anyone has an inflammatory condition i'd go straight in at step one the first few months and then go on to step two for maintenance so antioxidants of course i'm sure you're always recommending brightly colored fruits and vegetables to get lots of antioxidants in. This is quite important for thyroid health, really, for reducing oxidative stress. So especially if there's a lot of inflammation involved, it's going to help to reduce the cell damage to the thyroid. And the key ones to look out for are selenium and vitamin E. So selenium, especially due to the fact that it converts the T4 to T3 and then there's vitamin E as well. So I've got a few more questions. I'm just going to have a look at these. Sorry, uh, T3 stimulates production of GQ11 protein, which switches off production. So what was that in relation to? I think I'll come back to some of these questions later. There's quite a few coming through. Um, so Helen, in terms of your question, um, when dealing with inflammation and recommending high EPA, would you also be saying people should be on a low dietary source of omega-6? Of course, omega-3 and omega-6 should be balanced. It's, if someone can have, say, around a, a 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 ratio, so slightly more omega-6 in their diet, um, that would be absolutely healthy. But the issue is that a lot of people have much, much higher ratios, around 10 to 1, even 15 to 1. So if someone's having a fairly healthy diet, having nuts and seeds, and that's their source of omega-6, that's absolutely fine. Um, but if someone's having a high intake of omega-6 arachidonic acid, that being the most inflammatory omega-6, then that's when you need to watch out um, and balance this with omega-3 EPA. So rather than cutting out all these omega-6 foods, um, often it's a lot easier just to add in additional omega-6. So always ensure there's lots of antioxidants in the diet, of course. And vitamin E you're going to be getting from lots of nuts and seeds as well if you're recommending these foods. So there are of course some foods to avoid. Um, there's lots of artificial ingredients that have had not not too much research particularly, but a lot of anecdotal evidence from um, people suffering with thyroid issues and having sensitivities. So I would always generally recommend to cut out foods such as aspartum, anything that's artificial, for example, um, chemical estrogens as well, so plastics um, that have estrogen-like activity. This can sometimes cause issues in terms of the thyroid gland as well, in terms of affecting the TSH levels and thyroid function. So definitely try and cut out as much of the artificial ingredients, but that's um, quite usual practice really. Um, but some people are a little bit more sensitive if they have a, an underactive or overactive thyroid. Um, then there's soy. So, again, it's the estrogen hormone-like activity that can reduce thyroid um, function. So, if someone's having quite a lot of soy in their diet um, and they have a hypothyroidism, I would recommend um, cutting this out. And then there's all the goitrogen-containing foods. So, these are the foods that reduce the absorption of iodine in the body, so they reduce the uptake. 
Um, so there's lots of healthy foods here and people do get a little bit carried away with finding lists on the internet and cutting out lots and lots of healthy foods. So there's spinach, Brussels sprouts, it's all the greens, really broccoli, um, cabbage, cauliflower, and then there's a couple of fruits as well. So we have strawberries and peaches as well that, that will reduce iodine uptake. Um, but unless someone has a severe thyroid issue, most people are absolutely fine with these foods. It's not going to significantly reduce iodine uptake. However, if you cook these foods, that's going to reduce um, goitrogen levels. So it's much, much better to recommend clients to eat these foods and, and cook them rather than avoiding them completely. And they could be steamed. They don't have to be completely boiled to death. So it's nice to just ensure that they're not having ex extremely high levels of raw um, vegetables, for example. Someone's just asked, what should be the ideal ratio of DHA and EPA and recommendations for both? Um, if someone has an inflammatory condition, I would generally recommend EPA on its own as a supplement form. Um, and in terms of well-being, um, around a two to one ratio, so slightly more EPA to DHA would be good if someone has, has brought their levels down. Right, where was I? Um, so back to the, the foods that are high in groceries, yes, I would always recommend just cooking the foods to make sure that people can actually still include these healthy vegetables in their diet because too many people um, do end up cutting them out completely. So be wary of this. There's quite a lot of questions. I think I'll leave them for a little bit because I, I need to get through these slides. So next food to possibly avoid is gluten. And it's usually due to the interaction between gluten intolerances and autoimmune conditions. So whether it's cross reactivity um, between different grains, for example, uh, generally gluten causes more inflammation as well. Um, but in terms of autoimmune conditions, it's often not going to help if someone has quite high levels of gluten in their diet. So they don't necessarily have to completely avoid, but I would recommend considering this um, as an option. So for lifestyle, if someone comes to see you with weight issues, if they have an underactive thyroid, they're probably doing extreme amounts of exercise and trying to reduce their calorie intake to reduce their weight. Um, this is a really, really common issue I see. Um, this is how, of course, someone is going to go about trying to lose weight. But the issue is that with too much exercise, this causes so much more strain on the actual thyroid gland. And of course, that's going to reduce how well the body is metabolizing food. So metabolism um, will reduce. So I always recommend moderate exercise as opposed to extreme exercise if someone is really, really finding it difficult, their thyroid is underactive. So too much exercise is very, very intense. And this is hours of exercising. So maybe an hour, hour and a half each day. That would be um, quite a lot for someone who is an underactive thyroid. So consider more relaxing forms of exercise, um, for example, yoga, swimming, anything that's not um, extremely stressful on the body. And of course, recovery and rest are key as well for improving thyroid health. So ensuring that your clients are getting enough rest as well is very important, getting lots of sleep as well. And then there's also stress relief. That's going to have a knock on effect. Um, so being able to manage stress levels is, is always very helpful. So general lifestyle, I would often recommend that people relax a little bit more, sleep a little bit more, and do more relaxing exercise. And eventually if they can heal their thyroid gland, if they can get the function back to normal, then weight loss will, will come naturally afterwards. Um, it's often very difficult to explain to clients that you need to exercise less to lose weight. Um, but if you really explain how the thyroid works to them just briefly, um, then it can help in terms of if you say the next two, three months, we're going to concentrate on your thyroid health, get this perfect. And then afterwards, um, start adding in the exercise and, and looking at the diet in more depth. So this is a summary of the nutritional protocol for anyone with thyroid issues. So first of all, of course, you need to identify all the symptoms. So looking for easy weight gain. Um, weight loss as well, digestive symptoms, uh, skin health as well. So all of these, firstly, identify everything. Then, of course, refer to your GP 
ask the client to um, to visit their GP if they have any complaints of swelling or lumps, for example. Always make sure they they do this and you write this down for the, for the client as well. So next is testing. So of course you can do the temperature test to start off with, but then I'd recommend T4, T3, TSH, and iodine for some individuals as well. Um, the T4, T3, and TSH, and the urine test I would recommend um, as the most important to do, especially for hypothyroidism. So in terms of diet, I would always consider protein consumption. So for both the tyrosine and the iodine, so iodine being in fish, um, look at someone's fish consumption, general protein consumption as well to make sure they're getting enough of these very, very important um, tyrosine and iodine, iodine in. Uh, next is to balance inflammation. So once you've had a look at the diet, you've identified all the symptoms um, and anyone with thyroid issues, you just want to make sure the inflammation level is quite healthy um, so it's not pro-inflammatory. So look at the diet, the different omega-3 versus omega-6 fats, um, and then maybe consider the supplement as well. In terms of nutrient-dense food, include lots of foods providing all the micronutrients that are most important for the thyroid gland especially selenium. Um, so this, of course, for the conversion of T4 to T3. Then consider any that may be offending. So for example, gluten, aspartum. I always concentrate on the foods to add in initially to make sure that thyroid has everything it needs. And then lastly, I would consider any foods that may be aggravating the thyroid at all. So if you do it in stages, I'd recommend increasing protein, providing um, the selenium, for example, and then considering any foods to cut out. If you can do it all at once, that's amazing. But otherwise, if you do it in stages, I would say to consider that last. And then, of course, the lifestyle advice. So always make sure that your client isn't spending an hour a day on the treadmill um, to try and lose weight. That's going to really have much more of a, an impact in terms of stress on the thyroid. It's going to increase the inflammation as well. So that's really not going to help. Um, with weight loss and whether it's weight loss or weight gain always make sure that they're having um, adequate sleep and more relaxing forms of exercise so here's just some of the references I've used so feel free to have a read if you want to look into this in more detail and here are my contact details so Feel free to email if you have any further questions um, on this. And I think that is everything. So are there any more questions? I'm just going to have a read of this one more. So when hypothyroidism causes, um, say before menopause, is it worth considering estrogen dominance or progesterone deficiency? Yes, of course, that can happen, especially if someone's on HRT, that can sometimes um, have a little bit of a knock-on effect on thyroid health. So yeah, definitely consider hormone levels. So very, very cl closely linked. How quickly will your protocol burn belly fat? Well, that's a very difficult one to say. It really, really depends on the individual. Um, it can take a few months, really, to, to correct mild hypothyroidism so i would give give it a few months to actually sort out the thyroid first um and then weight loss i would usually recommend concentrate concentrating on that um afterwards so yeah a few months for the thyroid health and then perhaps a few months depending on how much weight the person needs to lose are there any more questions or is that it I've had quite a few questions as I've gone along, so perhaps you've all asked them. Lots of you are typing, so I'm just waiting a couple of seconds. Just a few thanks. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you've um, enjoyed the webinar, and I hope I've helped to explain um, exactly how the thyroid works and how you can help some of your clients um brilliant thanks for all the messages and thank you all for listening okay bye